Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Booth. It's a war we've been fighting for three decades now, and we have continually made the punishments in this war more and more severe. We're talking about substance abuse and the war on drugs. It hits home locally. But this year, with House Bill 348, we are contemplating taking a different tack and reversing direction to some degree in a hopes that we will have a better outcome. It's called House Bill 348, and that will be the topic of our discussion. But we need to start by understanding how the bill got its legs and what's in the bill itself. Here with that report is Derek Dowsett. Two thirds of the people who went to prison last year were already out, either on probation or parole, and blew it. Not a whole lot of them created new crimes, but a whole bunch of them just couldn't make it. They, did, they quit showing up, they didn't have a job, they just fell apart, their lives fell apart and we just watched it happen. Representative Eric Hutchings is on a decades-long crusade to improve the Utah State correction system and the way it deals with people who get tangled up in drug use. Hutchings' bill, House Bill 348, would fundamentally change the way we look and treat many of those drug offenders. The bill changes the status quo in four major ways. First, it requires a risk and needs assessment of people at the time of conviction to determine the best route for the offender. Most important thing to separate out the truly criminal from those that have substance abuse issues, those that have mental health issues, and they'll all be sent down different tracks with different types of treatment and different amounts of incarceration. This pre-screening process would come at the time sentence is rendered, not months after. The second element of the bill would reclassify some offenses from felonies to misdemeanors. The real problem is on the back end of it, and so this is something I've been very passionate about. Somebody gets a felony behind their name, and it's almost impossible at that point to not be a criminal. Where do you go for work? Where do you live? A lot of people won't hire someone with a felony criminal record. Additionally, the bill would substantially expand programming to not only help them kick the habit, but reintegrate them into the community. Basically, it's, it's, it's putting more investment in, in inmates so that when they're released, they have, they have vocational skills and they're accepted better in a society as functional type people, and, and, which will uh, reduce recidivism rate. Finally, the bill will provide better probation and parole service after they are out. We've done treatment before, but the problem is most of the treatment has been within the incarceration environment. And then when people get released back into the community, there's very little supervision and there's very little treatment that continues inside the community. When you're released, a probation officer does many roles. Uh, one thing that they do is they may pop up at your door at any given time and ask for a UA to see if you are clean or you've been using controlled substances. But they also make sure that you get the, the help you need as far as any aftercare that, that you may need. Uh, they, I know our, our probation officer that works in my area, he'll even help individuals find jobs, and, and, and they play a big role. To make all this work, proper funding for the counties will be a key issue. Many of the items contained in House Bill 348 are not currently funded. Another concern is the funding needed for mental health support, which is why most of those convicted get hooked on drugs in the first place. As a result, passage of the Governor's Healthy Utah Initiative becomes key to the success of House Bill 348. How it plays out in the next few days is yet to be seen. It has been noted that this approach to rehab has been well studied, but never tried. And Utah has the chance to lead the way. For the county seat, I'm Derek Dowsett. Thanks, Derek, for that report. Now we have an understanding of what's in the bill, what it intends to do. We will make an analysis of the pros and cons with our all-star panel when we come back after this commercial break right here on the County Seat. There are a couple great things about UNA Basin. One is it's still small, it's community. It makes you feel like when you go somewhere, you know everybody. Well, you know your neighbor, and your neighbor knows you, and you can trust each other. People look out for one another. I grew up in the UNA Basin, and I think that it's a good place to raise a family. So we packed up our three kids, and here we came to UNA County, and what a great place it was. It's not too big, it's not too small. And, and it has a lot to offer that you just don't get in the big city anymore. We all assume that the food we eat is safe, but how do you know? 
Well, it starts on the farm and continues every step of the way to your local grocery store. So when you bring home food, you do so with the peace of mind that it's safe, fresh, and nutritious, thanks to the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food, the guardians of Utah's food supply and sustainable agriculture. Learn more by visiting ag.utah.gov. Color, it's something that can be seen. But have you ever wanted to reach out and touch it? Experience it. In San Juan County, Utah color comes to life like nowhere else on earth. Color can be more than an abstract. Color can be your gateway to a new world. Visit San Juan County and explore the past, present, and future in a way that you've only dreamed of. San Juan County, color your experience. Remember those good old days? The places you went with your family when you were young. Reinvest in those old memories by making new ones. Beaver County is the perfect place to start that new tradition. Enjoy your favorite pastimes with family and friends. Connect with the history and culture of Utah in a place that's looking to the future. Modern conveniences minus the hustle and bustle of other locales. Beaver County, your adventure starts here. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today about the proposed rule. I believe it's got a bill number now, 348, which House is- House Bill 348. House Bill 348 by Eric Hutchins, which is the decriminalization and a change in the way we handle uh, prisoners and, uh, and, and their punishments, basically. Joining us for a panel discussion, Sheriff Jim Tracy from Utah County. Uh, who is also the president of the Utah Sheriff's Association. We have Sheriff Jim Winter from Salt Lake County, and we have Mark Thomas, who is the Uinta County attorney. He is the chairman of the Utah County and District Attorneys Association. What a mouthful, Mark. Yes, it is. <laughs> Leave it to attorneys. <laughs> That's right. We get paid by the word. <laughs> I, I would like to, uh, we've had a chance now to kind of find out what the motivation is and, and what the main components of Representative Hutchins' bill uh, are here. I would like to talk about the implications because from my perspective, I see uh, this potentially having a huge negative impact on the finances of both rural and urban counties. Um, you, from, from an attorney standpoint, what kind of problems are you guys gonna have? Well, I think uh, specifically when it comes to the cost, the, the concept is by reducing the level of offenses, uh, their proposal is to reinvest. So what the um, CCJJ has proposed is we'll put money uh, front-loaded into treatment and other sources for people who come into the criminal justice system with um, offenses that involve controlled substances. The real challenge to that is, so far the current language doesn't necessarily address that by reducing it to a misdemeanor. Um, a lot of the language that exists gives resources if they have a felony conviction, but we don't see where those resources are coming from misdemeanors yet. So that's a real concern, where are those coming? Also, if you don't have, uh, if they're not convicted of a felony, um, then the counties are the ones who have to pay the cost for incarceration uh, as opposed to the state. So that makes a, a difference. So from a strictly financial standpoint, um, it, it does impact how we uh, deal with the cases. So, so basically, your county attorney's office uh, gets some financial assistance when you're prosecuting felonies on behalf of the state? No, the county attorney doesn't. I'm just talking as the county in general, the yeah. county in general. So if you have somebody who's uh, committed to prison, then the state foots that cost. If you have somebody who has a probation violation because they're on a felony, then the state pays for the county jail for some of that incarceration. If you don't have a felony, the county has to pay for any incarceration that happens. What kind of impact is that gonna have for you guys? 
Well, if, if I may, I think uh, one of the, the issues when you in your opening remarks when you said it was decriminalization, I think we need to be careful that the, the bill does not decriminalize. It, uh, there's a, an emphasis on sentence deflation, which is, sounds like a term of art. It really is not. Uh, it, is, it is a legitimate uh, initiative. It's been undertaken in other areas of the country, and the, the emphasis is, you know, for uh, about uh, the last 30 years, we've been in a model in which uh, we have made offenses progressively more severe, sentences progressively longer. Uh, the costs of felony prosecutions are significantly higher. That's why when we go through this analysis of whether something's going to be a misdemeanor or a felony, one of the, uh, the, the, the touch points is, is, you know, is it worth it to prosecute it as a felony? What CCJJ, the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, and the Pew Research Foundation uh, have done is they have identified an opportunity to try and move offenses back into the realm that, in my opinion, tends to make more sense. But I would agree completely with my colleague uh, and those others in the district attorney's association uh, that I've spoken to, there's significant concerns that remain about the logistics of making this happen. The current bill structure, in my opinion, uh, and the, the language doesn't address some of the real critical needs that we will need as sheriffs uh, in managing jails and uh, uh, as, as this moves forward. But I think the concept, and this is what concerns me, is that the concept is good and it, it's going to be quickly uh, pushed aside because some of the Im implementation language is not necessarily clear. Jim, what, yeah. Well, to put, to put uh, a cost on it, or at least some perspective from our county, uh, the 1,200 prisoners that we have, a lot of the information that came to the Pew Foundation for study came from both Salt Lake and our county mm -hmm. jail, so we know these numbers. Uh, would be about 200 of these individuals would be, be affected by these types of reductions in the sentencing. What it would do is throw them out of what we call the COP, the, the, the uh, prisoners who are uh, not going to prison but coming to the jail based on a sentence that's been reduced. And we would lose the funding for that. And that would be about 1.2 million for just Utah County. So again, uh, hopefully if this is implemented and currently what we're doing doesn't really work well. We have that group that is surrounded by this whirlpool that comes in, they offend, they come out, they reoffend, and they just go in this whirlpool. So something needs to be done to help break that cycle. It goes down to the model and it goes down to the funding. So let me ask you a question now on that. If, if, if you're looking at about 1.2 million for Utah County uh, coming out of your jails that you're not being reimbursed for, how much is your overall budget? How, how big of a chunk of your out of budget? twenty-four million? So it's it's a notable number. It's enough. Well, and I again, I, I want to be clear. In our uh, in our county, we too we we average about three hundred and twenty-five, three hundred and fifty condition of probation inmates on a daily basis, in which we receive about fifty percent of our actual core costs as a, a recovery from the state. So the potential of those three hundred and twenty-five people in our county is about three point two million on an annualized basis. But to suggest that all three hundred people on any given day might be affected by this is is a bit of a, a you know, a stretch. Uh, clearly, some percentage of the individuals in the COP funding would be transmitted down to the to the to the county level if this were to go forward. But I think what we're all talking about here, I hope, is not that the concept itself is problematic. It is about implementation. And I think what I would like to be discussing is what can the counties do? Because as my colleague has said, and I would assume this is the same in the district attorney's realm, you know, we got to do something to treat this in a different way. We've been doing the same model for a long time and it just doesn't work. And so we've got to identify how we get people uh, out of jails that should be out of jail based on a risk needs assessment and get them into treatment and then get them supervised. Study after study indicates that supervised uh, management uh, is yeah. more effective than sentencing. Can I, can I say something? Sure. Here? What's interesting about it, though, is what the Pew Research Institute has done is they've created a program that really hasn't been tested anywhere else. And that's one of the concerns that we have as a county and district attorney association is this is a new model. And the concept of being able to get a risk and needs assessment so that we can help an individual is a good concept. But the model doesn't provide for that as it's written today. So that's a real critical feature and that we don't see in the language uh, of the bill as it sits, as it's been produced 
uh, today. The, the bill as it's produced today, many of the places that have done parts of this model, mm -hmm. but we would be the first to implement it fully. So then again, there are a lot of unknowns based on that going forward. But again, there's an opportunity to work this out with uh, the Department of Corrections and look at how we can come together and, and overcome these things. So again, the biggest issue for most of these counties is funding. And, and so I, I do want to redirect just slightly there. When somebody goes into the state system, they've got a parole officer, and so there is a level of supervision. But does this have a supervision capacity at the county level? Well, I think that's a fundamental question that uh, I and I, I think many of my colleagues want to raise, and the answer is yes, there's county-based probation, uh, but the, the implementation of it isn't addressed in this mechanism. There is a real fear that in misdemeanance they could be pushed to a model in which there, there isn't uh, supervision. And rural counties don't have any uh, probation for uh, uh, misdemeanance. Mm -hmm. So to make so. this program work correctly, there's going to be a new cost involved that the counties are going to have to bear if it's not addressed when we start this. Is that somebody needs to bear it, it if they want it to work? Okay, that's a great place to stop. We're going to take a break. We'll come back with the county seat and we'll talk about some of the benefits and the positive sides of this proposal when we come back. Stay with us. Canab. Base camp for your Southern Utah adventures. You belong in Kanab. There is a place where young and old make connections. Where kids feel like grown-ups, and grown-ups feel like kids. There is a place where beauty arises in contrast, where wonder is universal, and laughter second nature. There is a place where friends find a future, families find each other, and feelings find their home. There is a place. You go through the day-to-day -day repeating what you did yesterday. Don't you wish you could access that piece of your life that's missing? Find the beauty, serenity, family fun, or anything else that's missing from your life in the Cedar City Bryan Head area. Gain access to your adventure, whether it's camping, hiking, the arts, festivals, or just a getaway. Visit cedarcityayl.com for details on all the adventures that you can access in scenic Southern Utah. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today about uh, House Bill 348, which would move a lot of the drug-related and substance abuse felonies down to a misdemeanor status, the implications that it would have. And we've talked about the fiscal note on this, and we've kind of covered that, that there are things that need to be addressed. But let's talk about the concept side, because apparently this is a, uh, something that everybody recognizes needs to be dealt with. Uh, however, there are some people who are concerned that if you are going through four misdemeanors before you actually go up to a felony level, that you are not actually pulling people out of the whirlpool, you're putting them into it a little tighter. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, it's a legitimate concern, uh, but again, uh, you know, empirically the concept of, uh, for example, the three strikes you're out approach, uh, you know, has not been very beneficial from a criminological uh, standpoint. There is a, there is a, there's a legitimate uh, purpose uh, where you are incapacitating someone if they chronically offend, and I get that, and I think there are those individuals that need to be incapacitated through incarceration. But the vast majority of people, whether, and again, we're only talking right now about substance-related uh, crimes, in that environment, the vast majority of people can be rehabilitated and, and their behaviors modified, certainly to the point where uh, we would 
receive a better benefit than simply putting them in jail and, and, and the associated disruption with their families and the economic implications and so on. So I think how we address substance abuse uh, from, a, uh, from a criminological standpoint, it really does have to be discussed. So, uh, but when it comes to other offenses like sex offenses or, or thefts or forgeries, these kinds of things, a different conversation perhaps. But this conversation is limited to, in my opinion, uh, substance abuse. One of the other things about that is the perception of harm. One of the concerns that the county attorneys have is that perception of harm. If you change the classification to a misdemeanor, uh, a lot of times you'll see, if it's perceived to be not as serious, an increase in, in that use. So that is a real concern that we have, uh, that somebody who would otherwise say, you know, I'm not going to try this particular uh, type of drug because there's a felony attached may have a different view looking at it from a misdemeanor standpoint. So that's one of the concerns that we have about that. Uh, so yeah. This is though more focused on, on, on use problems, not that's on right. distribution the problems. Pew, the Pew Foundation study was very careful to segment out those who were, who were offending for the lifestyle and for the uh, living of, on that drug money versus those who may offend based on the fact that they're trying to raise money for their addiction. So again, though, it comes down to the point that those who are addicted have to have uh, an ability to, to get out of that cycle. Right. Treatment is about half the cost per day of incarceration. So there is savings there if we can move them into that model mm -hmm. and then with the proper supervision, make sure that they continue to get that treatment so that they can graduate out of that and become, you know, basically a, a citizen that's got production and, and, and a good life ahead of them. And, and I think to this exact point, you know, what people need to, to, to recognize is we are operating under a finite resource. I only have so many beds in the facility. You only have so many. There's only so many jail beds. We're full. A, that is exactly right. So the question has to become sociologically, you know, are we going to take people that uh, really would benefit more from being having other options and taking up that bed space, oftentimes for significant periods of time, whether it's pre-sentence or post-sentence or uh, waiting for programs or a variety of other issues, you know, they're filling up these jail beds. And, and we've got other more serious offenses knocking at our doors. So oftentimes when you're in a cap management plan, which we have been for 15 years, we are making a triage about who should come and who should go. Frankly, I would much rather deal with this subset of people in a different way opening up beds, because there's not a horizon of new beds, uh, uh, you know, anytime soon. So I think that's another fact we have to look at. And, and, and to say the, suggest that the model has not been validated, there are other um, uh, countries and other states that have moved down a, a similar path with very significant positive results. The question is, paradigmically, is our community, you know, ready for some of those changes uh, in approach? And, and I hope we are. Well, and I, I got to disagree with you on the paradigm. This paradigm that they're proposing hasn't been tested anywhere else. Well, this is a new one. You got to admit, Pew even admits that. This is new. Well, they, what they suggest is the sentence deflation is new, not the concept of treatment-based versus incarceration-based. And so I would agree with you that the language in the bill is not specific, therefore there is no real plan. And I, and I think that that's is where a, the, That's where the rubber meets the road. That's, that's what 100%. we still need. Yes, sir. I, I would mm -hmm. agree with that. All right, with that, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with our closing thoughts on this. I wish we had an hour, uh, but maybe we can stretch a little bit, a bit out for our online viewers, and we'll be right back with the county seat. Landscapes as diverse as the people who venture to find them await. All you have to do is find a place to begin. Moab, Utah, in Grand County, where adventure begins. ATV, check. Four wheel driving, check. Bouldering, check. Mountain biking, check. Hiking, check. River rafting, check. Adventure is about more than just crossing activities off of a list, but hey, if you can find a place that gives you everything you're looking for, all the better. In Emory County, you'll find the San Rafael Swell, trails, lakes, and the small town hospitality you're looking for. San Rafael Country, in the heart of Utah. Visit us and check something off your list. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? 
Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil Fall. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. I let me. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today about uh, House Bill 348. If you just joined the conversation, I'm going to invite you now to make a note to go back and rewatch this on our website, thecountyseat.tv. It's on our YouTube channel. This is a very good conversation, and we will continue this conversation in a special online extension of this program right after we're done here on the air. Okay, let's let's go back and uh, you know we're we are talking about. Um, the concept of this being good, and there's some there's some value in in perhaps getting people out of that system. One of the things we haven't touched on, though, is part of this needs to be better uh, uh, programming, not so much as licking the habit, so to speak, but finding something for people to do when they get out. Because I don't think we do really good vocational rehabilitation as part of the program. Has that been discussed as part of this uh, concept? Right. Right. No, uh, again, the, you know, as my colleagues have said, devil's in the detail. But to your point, uh, we we know that if you eliminate the so-called criminogenic influences, and that's a big word for the negative influences in people's lives, not that substance abuse can be abated. And what does that mean? That means job, that means social circle, that means uh, uh, community involvement, uh, that means uh, a place to live. All of those factors have to be addressed. I mean, you can't expect somebody to go into jail, be there for a year, get out and have the same circle of friends, no money and no, no prospects, and say, why isn't it you're not kicking your habit? So that piece is very complicated, and that's what we're talking about here is moving towards. Do we want people to be productive, or do we want them to be recycling through our facilities? And uh, unfortunately, this bill has scratched the proverbial surface in starting a conversation, but it hasn't done a very good job, and I hate to be blunt, in really abating the concerns that are very legitimate by the counties, the prosecutors, the sheriffs, and so on. And, but we, we want, I think, to very much have the conversation. I, I hope it you know, this bill does that. The state started with this study, with the governor's request. The counties want to be partners. The, the issue is there are many unknown and unsolved issues, and many of them revolve around who's going to pay. Where does the funding come from? Last thought. It's incomplete. There's a lot of work still to be done. Folks, I'm going to editorialize here for just a second as we wrap up the program. Of all the issues that we've covered during this legislative season, this really is one of the key and most important issues because we have a large societal uh, segment that, that has an opportunity to actually change uh, lots of people's lives, hundreds, thousands of people's lives, if we do it right. So this is one that we encourage you to be engaged in talk to your legislators about, and please become a little bit better informed. Uh, stay with us. We are going to continue this discussion online right after the break. Uh, thank you for joining us on the county seat. We will see you next week, or we'll see you online in just a minute. If you like this video, then we invite you to subscribe to our channel, The County Seat. You can do that here and we invite you to share with your friends. We also invite you to get all the latest up-to-date information by following us on our social media channels. And if all else fails, make sure that you watch the county seat Sunday morning at 8.30 right here on ABC4 Utah.